Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. So great to see everyone out. And don't put that song book up. Leave it open to page number three. Was that not a most beautiful, beautiful song? I, I absolutely love that song. I just wanted to get that plug in there before we get into our lesson. Don't put your song books up because that song is what we're going to talk about this morning. But again, it's great to be here. It's so great to see everyone out. I couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. There are many songs that I know that you and I both sing uh, and, and songs that we love. But when you think about Songs that we love. I mean, can you think of one that uh, touches the hearts greater than the song that we just sang? How great thou art. What a beautiful song. And I, I mean, when you think about that song and, and you think about its greatness and its beauty, and it's, it's not just the melody that makes this song great, even though it's a, it's a song that just... I mean, sends chills up and down our back. But, but again, it's not the melody of the song that, that should cause us to feel so good. But, but it's the very thought and the very idea of the song, meaning that this particular song is a wonderful song, one that uh, is truly, truly great. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. When you think about that particular part of the song, it tells us the very purpose of this song. And what is the purpose of this song? The, the purpose of this song is for you and I to stop and to recognize what a true, great, wonderful, and awesome God that you and I serve. Amen. He is truly the greatest God that you and I have ever, ever known. In fact, throughout the Bible, His greatness is portrayed over and over and over again. And we're just going to look at a few verses. I began to look at the greatness of God, and, and there were so many verses that talked about His greatness. I've got them recorded and put back for a latter date, but I couldn't help but share some of these verses that talk about how great He is. I love the passage that was read for us earlier talking about the greatness of God. But again, here in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 25, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. It doesn't stop there. What about 1 Chronicles 17 and verse 20? I love the way that the Bible says, there is none like you, O Lord. There is no God beside you according to all that we have heard with our ears. There is no being, no one in all the world that you and I can compare to God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that He has no equal, none whatsoever. There's not a certain individual, there's not an entire group of individuals that that you and I could sit over here and they would be equal to God. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25, God says, To whom then will you compare, compare me that I should be like them, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. And, and He brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of His might, and because He is strong in power, nothing is missing. God is such a great, great being. And if there has ever been a song that you and I have sang, one that we love, one that we appreciate, it's the song that we just sang, How Great Thou Art. This particular song was written back in 1886. It was written by a Sweden minister by the name of Carl Boberg. Now it initially began as a poem, but throughout time it evolved into a hymn. It wasn't until some 40 or 50 years later, if you'll look at your song book at the very top right hand corner, the name is Stuart, uh, Stuart Hine. This particular gentleman put the musical notes to this song and it became a very popular song in the early 1950s and since then it is recognized as one of the most popular songs in the world today when it comes to religion and Christian worship. But I think what this song does is it brings out at least three different points that cause us to recognize the greatness of God. Now don't get me wrong. 
There are many, many, many other points that we could bring out pointing out the greatness of God. Uh, the Bible is literally filled with verses that talk about His greatness. But in this particular song that we just sang this morning, and one that we sing so many times, and, and if you could have just been up front to hear your voices singing that wonderful song and how beautiful it is, and, and the chills that literally go up my back when I hear my brethren sing these songs, and, and I'm with them and we sing this song. It's a wonderful, beautiful song. I think that there are at least three points that are brought out, though, in this song that point out the greatness of God. And the very first one is the fact that He is Creator. Look at stanza one. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds Thy hands have made. When you think about the world in which we live, and the many worlds that are believed to be out in our universe today, galaxies that exist, how did they get there? The Bible teaches us that God made them. He is the creator of every galaxy that exists in our world today. When you think about the galaxy in which you and I live, it's recognized as the Milky Way. The Milky Way is, is not only the galaxy wherein you and I find planet Earth and the sun and moon and all of those different planets, but, but if you'll note, it is a very large, a very large galaxy. Do you know how long it would take to get from here to here? Do you know the size of the galaxy in which you and I live? Do you? It's recognized as, as being or having the diameter of 100,000 light years. Now, how much is that? Light is said to travel at 186,000 miles per second. All right? You get a hold of that speed. 186,000 miles per second. If you could travel at that rate for 100,000 years, that's how long it would take you to get from one side to the other. That's, folks, that's a number that is far beyond my finite mind to be able to comprehend and understand. And how is it that that particular universe in which you and I live was formed and created? The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12, It is He who made the earth by His power, who established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding He stretched out the heavens. It was God who literally spoke in this galaxy in which you and I live, and we have a difficult time comprehending it, He just caused it to come into existence. What an awesome God we have because He is the Creator of this universe. But not only is He the Creator of the universe, look at the song continues on. The song says, if you'll note there in the latter part of stanza one, I see the stars. You think about all of the stars out in just our galaxy alone. Just in the Milky Way. Isn't it beautiful to go outside on a beautiful clear night and you look up in the sky and you see all of those stars? Well, folks, we haven't touched the hem of them. In our galaxy alone, astronomers say that there are approximately 100 billion stars. What if you had to number them every one? Well, that would be a job, wouldn't it? If you got you a job, number. listen to me, you couldn't do it. You, you couldn't spend the rest of your life numbering the stars because just when you thought that you had them figured out, there would be others that would appear that you didn't see before. How would you keep track of them? You couldn't. There's no way possible that you could number the stars just in our galaxy alone, much less any of the other galaxies. And you know what I find so amazing? Psalm chapter 147 and verse 4, the Bible says He counts the numbers of the star and He calls them not by name. Not only does God have every star numbered, He knows the exact number of stars. He has them each one named and He knows where they are. You're talking about an awesome God. No wonder we say how great Thou art. But not only is He the creator of the, the universe and the stars, think about the thunder. The song continues on, I hear the rolling thunder. Now folks, when you've got thunder, you've got lightning. You're not going to have one without the other. If you hear a rumble of thunder, somewhere off in the distance, lightning has hit the ground. Lightning is a, a fascinating thing. Call me crazy, 
I love, as long as I can keep my distance from it now, I, I love to watch a, a storm, an electrical storm. It's just, a, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. I had some friends one time who would go out into a field and they would sit in an old car and, and they would watch it. I wouldn't go with them because I know that when lightning takes place, it's, it's going from the ground up. It's particles that are made and you've got negative particles that are coming down and positive particles that are going up from objects that are on the ground and that, that vehicle could have been one of those objects. But nevertheless, when you have a flash of lightning, all around that bolt of lightning, the air is heated to 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now folks, that's six times hotter than the surface of the sun. And as that air is heated, it begins to immediately try to cool back down. And as a result of going back, trying to cool back down, there is a pop or a crack in the air, and that's the flash of lightning, and that's the pop that you hear. And then the rumble is going through that column wherein the lightning bolt goes down. And you think about a bolt of lightning and all of its awesome power. It's no wonder that the writer of this song would go on to say when he talked about the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is made. Why is that? It's because God is the one who is in control of thunder. I love the word of words of Job in Job 37 beginning in verse 2. Hear attentively the thunder of His voice and the rumbling that comes from His mouth. He sends it forth, the whole heaven, His lightning to the ends of the earth. After it a voice roars, He thunders with His majestic, majestic voice and He does not restrain them when His voice is heard. God thunders marvelously with His voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend for He says to the snow, fall on the earth likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of His strength. Who is in control of that thunder and that lightning every time you see it? God is. I often think about the fact of when Jesus and His disciples were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. In Matthew chapter 8, beginning about with verse 20 and going through about verse 27 and 28. And the Bible says there's a great tempest that arose on the sea. And I often wonder, maybe there was thundering and maybe there was lightning. We know that the waves were leaping here and there and it was beginning to fill the boat and they woke Jesus up and said, Lord, we're going to perish. Maybe we're going to be struck by lightning. Maybe we're going to drown. And the Lord stood up and said, peace be still. And there was a calm like they had never seen. Don't you know at that moment, those disciples were thinking, how great thou art. You see, he's in control of all of that, brethren. What about the earth? There is something unique and interesting about that spear upon which we live. Now, I love planet earth because of the fact that that's what, where God put me. But if you think about planet earth, do you realize that not only did God make it, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but He made everything that is within it. Everything that you and I see in the world or on the earth today, it was put there by God Himself. Genesis 1 and verse 11, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. God not only created this earth upon which you and I live, but He created everything that you and I see. Think about some of the things that the song makes mention of. Woods and forest glades. It is said, according to the history of the writing of this particular song, that, that Mr. Carl uh, Boberg, he was walking along, he was going from worship services one day, and he was going through the forest, and he was going through the woods, and, and he began to recognize its great beauty. Folks, there's, there's another reason why I love to hunt. It's not just because of the harvest that I get. Just being in the woods, that, that there is a peacefulness um, there is a feeling that you get when you're out there and you look around and you recognize that none of this got here on its own. It was all put here by God. What about the birds singing sweetly? Oh, how, how sweet it is to sit and to watch those little birds fly down and to begin to sing such a sweet song on a tree. And, and, and you wonder, who put that song in that bird? 
You know, folks, it was God Almighty. The song goes on to talk about lofty mountain grandeur. Maybe some of you have been to places like the Grand Canyon or, or the Smoky Mountains or, or, or some place that you were able to look out over the valleys beneath and, and, and you have to conclude, who made this? God did. I remember a few years ago, Kelly and I and the children, we went to, we went to Gatlinburg to, to, to take a vacation and, and the place where we stayed, we'd never been there before and we, we we went to this, this condo and we got there and we walked out on the balcony and there was just the most beautiful scene. And, and, and me and, and the girls were standing there and then Andrew came out and, and I picked him up and I said, look at there, buddy. I said, ain't God good? I said, ain't. I'm sorry. I should have said isn't. But I wanted him to know that, that God was the one who had made that. And when you and I have the opportunity to see such visions of beauty, know that God made it. What about the sound of the brook? A brook that is just trickling slowly by and you can hear the water spilling. Oh, what a peaceful and, and serene sound that is and, and just a gentle breeze. Maybe it's coming through the woods. Maybe it's coming off of that brook. Maybe it's coming up from that lofty grandeur. But all of that, who, who put it there? God did. He is the creator of any and everything that you and I know today. And I love the writer of the Hebrews in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed. How? By the Word of God. Can you imagine everything that you and I know that exists in our world today that, that is of any use, we have to make it with our hands. Everyone who came here this morning in a vehicle, someone had to take it together and take their hands and put that vehicle together. The house you live in, it didn't just jump together, someone built it. But this world in which we live, planet Earth, the Milky Way galaxy that we just made mention of, God simply spoke. And it came to be. That's the God that you and I serve. And therefore, folks, we ought to conclude how great God is because He's the Creator of everything that you and I know. But not only is God the Creator of everything we know, He is our Savior. I get lost sometimes thinking about how that He is the Creator of, of everything around me. You know, you think about this world, you, you, you see pictures of planet Earth, you see pictures of the Milky Way galaxy and, and nature and so forth. And, and, and though we may step back and say, man, that's just awesome. That's not His greatest creation. You see, you are. You are by far God's greatest creation, man. After He had created everything that He made, the earth and the seas and the land and the trees and all the animals, He said to the Son and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image. And in verse 27 of Genesis 1, so God created man in His own image. In the image of God created Him. Male and female created He them. And I think it's very interesting, and you read the text to see if I'm not right on this, that throughout that text in Genesis chapter 1, every time God created something, He'd say, it is good. Day one, it is good. Day two, it is good. Day three, it is good. And then when He created man, He said it's very good. Why is that? Because folks, He had put the icing on the cake. He, he had just expressed His greatest creation. And so when you look at yourself, and you consider yourself, look in the mirror, you need to recognize that God is great because He made me. It's not a matter of what you look like, how tall you are and how short you are, or, or whatever you are, however you appear, the very fact that God made you. Folks, that should set us in awe. And I'll tell you something else that should set us in awe and cause us to realize how great He is, and that's the plan that He set in order, in order to save man. Folks, that plan, you and I, and that plan that He set in order, is greater than everything that we have looked at thus far. You see, He made us, and along with making us, He construed a plan that would save us. That would cause us to be able to go and be with Him for eternity. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just, now watch it what it says. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and without blame before him. When did God begin this plan? Was it the fact after he created man, put him on earth and said, "Uh oh, I made a mistake? No, folks. Well, the foundation of the world, before He made this world in which you and I live, before He created you and me, He already had a plan set in motion that would save us when we went wrong. You want to talk about a great God. Folks, there's no one who can surpass Him. How much do you mean to God? Too often we live our lives thinking, well, I don't mean anything to God. That's not what this song teaches us. It's certainly not what the Bible teaches us. Look at stanza two, or, or stanza three. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing. You see that? God did not spare His Son. When we read, or maybe we've got John 3, 16 memorized. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I wonder if we truly recognize and understand the depth of that verse. Only begotten Son. Monogenes in the Greek. Meaning one of a kind. Unique. There was not another one like Him from which the Father could pick and give for you and me. It's not like the fact that he had a line of sons here and he could just pick up. He only had one. And the Bible says that he gave his son. He wasn't willing to spare him. He wasn't willing to come up with a different way, a different plan, because he knew that redemption required a special, unique sacrifice. And therefore, he offered his son. You want to talk about how much he loves us and how meaningful we are to him? I love Romans 8, 32. He, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. Now look at what the rest of the Roman writer says. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you ever question the fact, well, God's just not taking care of me. Listen, that's not right, folks. He's given us the greatest gift by giving us his son, meaning there's nothing. You want to know how important you are to God? There's nothing he wouldn't do for you. He spared His one and only unique Son for you and for me. That's how, I, how much I mean to God. But, but it doesn't stop there. Notice the, son, if, notice the song as it continues on to stanza three. Sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. You see, Jesus bore my burden on the cross. He didn't bear his own burden. He was free from sin, was he not? John chapter 8 and verse 46, he would ask the, the religious leaders on that day, he would say, which of you can convince me of sin? I mean, he's putting his life on display and said, here I am, point out sin in my life. How could he do that? Because Peter said he did no sin. He never committed sin in the life that he lived. I couldn't stand before you and say, okay, which one of you here this morning wants to convict me of sin? Because if you dig deep enough, you could find some. But Jesus could stand up and say, find sin in my life. Because he knew that he didn't have any. And they knew he didn't have any. And because of that, I mean, he went to the cross for my sin. And your sin, not his own sin. Peter would say in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, 24, who himself bore our sins, not his own sins. An individual who went to the cross was an individual who was guilty of some kind of crime. And that crime was so stiff that it was worthy of death. And Jesus didn't go to the cross for His own sins. He didn't go to the cross for something that He had done wrong, but He went to the cross because of something that you and I had done wrong. We had given into sin. And He bore, his, bore in His own body our sins on that tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You see, Jesus, who did not know sin, became sin so that you and I could be righteous. What an awesome, awesome God. How great He is to go to the cross for something that, that listen, I deserve to be on that cross. 
And, and, and you deserve to be on that cross. And all of us deserve to be on that cross. He did not. And he went there for us. You want to talk about a great God? And you know what's so fascinating? That he went with joy. I love the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went to the cross with joy? How is that? He knew what that effort was going to accomplish. His plan. Having you and me in heaven with Him someday. You see, that's the God that you and I serve. He went to the cross with joy so that we could have forgiveness of sins. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God is great because He is our Savior. And he went to the cross for you and for me. But God is great because of the return of Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we are given the commands or we have given the promise that Jesus is coming back. In John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, He knew that His disciples were troubled because He had just told them, I am going to have to leave you. And He says to them, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What's the promise that Jesus Jesus is making, I'm coming back. And throughout the New Testament, we see that promise over and over and over again. Now, how many people do you know who leave this world today and they promise you that they're going to come back? And they keep their promise. You can't do it. Not without this man. But because of the fact that this man was resurrected from the grave, it gives me hope that someday I can be resurrected from the grave. But only a God of supreme power could say, I'm coming back. And He is going to come back. Right now, He is making ready heaven for you and for me. And someday He's going to come back. And when He comes back at the return of Jesus Christ... The, the, the song says, note if you will, that there will be a shout of acclamation. Look at stanza four. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. What does the word acclamation mean? It refers to a shout of victory and approval. If there's something that you and I often seek in this life, it's the approval of other people. And we don't always get it, do we? Simply because of the fact that you can't please everyone. You can try as you may, be the best person you can possibly be, and there's going to be someone who will not approve of you and your actions. But good people, that will never happen with God. When Jesus comes back, if I have been living faithful to the Lord, doing my very best, giving my all, then I will hear those wonderful words proclaim, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's what I look forward to. And, and when you think about the, the very fact that He has the power to look down upon me, a sinner who fails Him quite often, and to say, I approve of you because you were giving your best. What an awesome God He is. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. What a blessed occasion that's going to be. And that proclamation to be able to hear, Well done. How awesome that's going to be. I mean, we are going to be, at that moment, we are going to be ushered into the heaven, ushered into the very presence of God. And folks, we can't look at the entire chapter of Revelation chapter 21, but just take a gander at verse 4. We're going to be in a place where we're going to be with God. We're going to be with the Father. We're going to be with the Son. We're going to be with the Holy Spirit. God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. All of those bad things that you and I know in this life are gone. Now you name another being who has the power to do that. There is none. But God has that great power. But not only is the return of Jesus going to be an occasion of acclamation, 
But the return of Jesus is also going to be a time of adoration. N note the song as it continues on. And take me home, this is the lat latter part of, of stanza four. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Every Lord's Day, we come together for the purpose of adoration. We're here this morning because we have God in adoration. What does that mean, someone who had, or what does the word adoration mean? It refers to an individual who is giving worship or, or gratitude to another because of great deeds in their lives. And that's what we do each Lord's Day. We come together to give God adoration. We come together to thank Him, to, to praise Him, to worship Him because of everything that He has done. And, and, and that's the reason that everyone who is here this morning, my, my prayer is that's why you're here. But in heaven, good people, oh, n never before will we ever experience worship and praise and fellowship that we will experience there. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, after these things I looked, and behold, great multitude which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out of the loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I cannot imagine how great it's going to be in the very presence of God forever and ever and ever. Makes me say, oh God, how great thou art. What's the conclusion? When we come to a conclusion of the fact that God is so great, look at the stanza or look at the chorus. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. You see, when we recognize how truly great God is, that will be the song we will sing every day that we live. Every day we'll get up and we'll go about our day talking about how great God is. And we're going to live in such a way that we're going to show that His greatness lives through you and me. What about you this morning? Are you an individual? who you live your life every day proclaiming how great thou art. Are you? If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God. You haven't begun that journey. You're not expressing to people how great God is. And you don't want to be that kind of person. You want to leave here this morning letting every person you know recognize that God is good. He's great. There's no one like Him. Come believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God, and let us baptize you for the remission of sins. And you leave here this morning singing how great thou art. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God and your life is not right. Maybe there are some things there that, that ought not be there. Then, and now's the time to make those corrections. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing.